what helped me, and I do think, though, it, it is still a current way to connect with people is by going out to hear people playing music. The group you like, go out and hear them and connect with these people. And tell them how much you love hearing them play. Become friends and you have a relationship with these people. You might get invited to sit in. They get to hear you play. They're like, yeah, I need a bass player. I had such a great time chatting with Marlene Rosenberg for the podcast. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting with one of the hardest working, most active jazz bassists in the Chicago area, and that's Marlene Rosenberg, who I've known for years. In fact, one of the unique pleasures of doing this podcast is discovering with somebody like Marlene how much shared background we have and we get deep into that. We both went to Northwestern at the same time and I don't think we realized it. We were just traveling in different circles but we have so many shared contacts and influences and role models and we talk about several of them throughout the episode including Folks at Northwestern like Don Owens and Mike Coker, who's moved on to... Actually, both of them have moved on from Northwestern at this point. Don Owens, D.O., has retired, and Mike Coker is down at Arizona State. But we have so much in common, Marlene and I. We've taught together at the Chicago Bass Festival, and we dig into that and much more, including Marlene's biggest bass influences, how the Chicago jazz scene has changed over the years, developing technique teaching, creativity, Francois Raboth, Bach, so many topics. We'll also be hearing several excerpts from Marlene's album, Why Maya? And you can find that and much more at her website, marlenemusic.com. We've also got some great sponsors for this episode, Diderio Strings, Upton Bass, and the Bass Violin Shop, and more on them later. But let's dig into our chat with Marlene Rosenberg and these crazy amount of shared connections that we both have. I did not realize. So you did your master's at Northwestern, like late 90s, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. I was totally there those years. Like you were like 98, 99. I was, I was doing my master's and I was <clears throat> in, in cl- classical bass performance, but I was taking lessons with Mike Coker like that exact same time. Um, oh my goodness. I know. Isn't that hilarious? Small world. <laughs> Wow. Oh, that's weird. Yes, it is small because, yeah, I graduated, what was it, 99. We were there exactly the same time. Wow. I know. Isn't that, I, I, I had been doing, like before that I'd been doing some jazz playing, you know, I was there, I, I went to study with Jeff Bradditch and I got there right when he left. So, you know, he, he left in the, the, and so did the entire bass department, right? So I was one right. of very, right. very, very few bass players. So even though like I kind of consider myself like I'm an, an amateur jazz player, I did, you know, everything at Northwest because they just didn't have anybody. So, you know, I was playing in big band with Dio and Tony Garcia and so it's funny I like all these names it's like that's totally like my college experience is all these people you worked with oh my goodness well we must have been ships passing in the night or so I each other didn't know who we were wow well Jason I'm glad that we met (laughs) (laughs) after the fact I know In terms of jazz, that year was like I was playing in one combo and then I was taking with Mike Coker. And I just can't say enough good things about like those lessons. I just learned so much about jazz, music, uh, the language, improvisation. I did, Were you doing like uh, piano lessons with Mike or were you doing lessons on the bass with Mike? How did that work? Um, I was taking piano with him. Cool. I didn't do very well, but I was taking with him. <laughs> I have those notes. <laughs> yeah, and um, some sort of, you know, improv theory. He was great. Yeah. I love Mike. I mean, we, we've known each other for years before I even did that and played at a club called the Sardine Bar. Mm. The Gold Star Sardine Bar. Long story short, anyway, we did a duo there for a long time. 
uh, many years on like a Monday night, Tuesday night, a lot of gigs in town. And he started teaching in Northwestern. Now he's uh, Arizona State. And mm-hmm. I just saw him this last year at one of these jazz festivals where I adjudicated and played. And Jim McNeely was there. It was like this sort of Champaign, Illinois, which is where I did my undergrad. Mm-hmm. U of I, Champaign, Urbana, sort of reunion between where Mike Coker was from, did his undergrad, too. Oh, so Mike did his undergrad there, too. I didn't. Re- I, I never knew where he'd done his schooling. Okay, how cool is that? It's great to have those sort of reunions. Yeah, in engineering, by the way, I might add. <laughs> he got his yeah, engineering degree. But, you know, back then there was no jazz-specific program like there are all over now. I actually created my own program because there was an open option. And so I petitioned out of the regular, all the regular stuff. Plus, backtracking, I was a clarinet player. That's how I got into U of I. And then I changed bass. And they had such a, they had like six jazz bands and a bunch of teachers that played jazz and classical and were way into it. So we just had this community of people where, you know, that's how we learned. (laughs) That's how I learned. And people that would just come back and hang that had already graduated. It was this this big scene. It was 1977, and I graduated technically in 81. I left in 80. I had a dangling English class to take that I did online, or not online, but in correspondence. Back in the dinosaur days, you had to write papers and then send them through the Pony Express mail. (laughs) Remember that? (laughs) (laughs) Called correspondence classes, not online. Yeah, but there was so much playing in so many places to play. It was as good or better <laughs> in a lot of ways. Jams every night, hanging with the teachers, listening, you know, either listening at their house or in the, the music library with friends. You know, they had rooms you could listen to Psy. Pretty, pretty wonderful. <laughs> Was Chicago the next step for you then? Did you come back to town and start start working? Yeah. Since it was such a new instrument for me at that point, too, and I had all this network, you know, I knew I could work. <laughs> so I just came up here where a lot of people were coming down from there that already graduated. So I, you know, I had people to, to hang out with, to get gigs, you know, all kinds, weddings, you name it. Much different than I think the young people have these days. Not that those don't exist, they do, but not at the level uh, that was, you know, accelerated into the late 80s. It was kind of in the late 80s that that started to change, that the, the, the club started to dry up. Is that kind of when that started to happen in Chicago? Um, in New York, too. I mean, it was a crap, you know, that financial crash. And, and then the, the 90s until we got to 2007, that, that just that took it all out. <laughs> 2007, just, it was like a, a giant seiche that just took out a lot of the jingle houses here in Chicago, probably a ton in New York, too. You know, just, just a lot of that kind of work really took a beating. And some of it's coming back, but it, I don't foresee it. I'm not a fortune teller, but I don't really see it coming back at that, that level that it was roaring, the roaring 80s, right? The roaring 80s. <laughs> Yeah. Next up, we dig into Marlene's multifaceted career and how she's developed this career. But first, I'd like to give a shout out to Diderio Strings. We're talking about their Zyx Strings. And here's Orchestral Strings product manager Lyris Hung talking about what goes into those Zyx cores. 
they fall into mostly what's called a multi-filament, and that just means lots of filaments, <laughs> many filaments. Uh, so it's like a bundle of um, fibers, basically, like plastic fibers. Visually, it resembles something like a bunch of, of doll's hair, you know, like a bunch of very fine pieces of thin, thin plastic kind of bundled together. <laughs> That's the sound of my Jackstat with Zyx on it. Isn't that a cool sound? It's a very ringing open sound. Very cool. I used those strings for a solo recital earlier this year and really dig them. Learn more at ContraBaseConversations.com slash strings. And thank you also to Upton Bass for sponsoring the podcast. So great to have you guys on board. And here is a clip from Mark Ramirez, former podcast guest based over in Lisbon, Portugal, about how Upton made a copy of Mark's Cavani bass. I do a lot of uh, moving around and giving master classes and stuff like this. I had a, a copy made of it. By uh, by the Uptons, by Gary and uh, Eric Roy uh, at the Upton at the Upton shop, um, they made a copy of it. But they made an even smaller copy. I think it's a seven eighths copy of the bass. Uh, I use it now. I use that bass for my solo playing, mm -hmm. uh, which which I do a lot. Recently, I've been doing a lot, especially here, and it has a detachable neck. The detachable neck, man, I tell you, in Europe, it's the craze. Learn more at UptonBase.com, and thank you for sponsoring the podcast, guys. All right, back to our conversation with Marlene Rosenberg. Well, the cool thing with, like, look, just like an outsider, like, looking at your career, you've just done so much, right? And, like, in that you've gotten into world music like you have, and and then you have this, this so many, uh, such a uh, rich array of teaching uh things that you've done over the years because i mean you're are you still at northern yes i am okay that's what i thought <laughs> that's what i thought um but then you're also like like you're involved what what does your teaching world look like right now what are some of the other places you're involved with in addition to northern i will this fall have a student at roosevelt and i've been on on staff there for maybe five years maybe even longer i forget because some years i don't even work there but i'm on the faculty and other years you know i'll go in for a couple of clinics this last year i co-taught a student with scott mason who's sort of running the program and a bassist as well a great teacher and so we you know he wanted to study with me a little bit so we split the lessons up which was cool um this year i have a student uh that i'll teach primarily um uh, at Roosevelt, and then I'll teach at Northern, and I'm looking for work. <laughs> I'll tell you, yeah, you know the adjunct, the adjunct hop, the adjunct hop. I know that I like that. <laughs> I I know that I know that world well. <laughs> yeah, I figured you did. And I taught at Northwestern for about seven, six, seven years. I was teaching improv, and then uh, always had a combo that I coached. I'm happy to be at Northern. I'm doing coordinating the uh, uh, combo program, and then I have my base students. I really have been there for, like, probably over 20 years, but I was there 13 teaching base, and then I went to Western Illinois and taught there. It was my first full-time position for three years, and it wasn't going the way I wanted it to financially, and then my daughter was in her teenage years at that point and I didn't want to miss out on some of the great experiences, one experiences in their child's teenage years. <laughs> so, yeah, I came back and that's when Northwestern started. And then Ron Carter, the year before he retired, Ronald Carter of Northern, the year before he retired as the director of jazz studies, asked me to come in and coordinate the combo program and help out with some of that administrative stuff, and then teach the students base. DeKalb is not right next to Chicago, but it's a hop, skip, and a jump compared to Western Illinois. That's a, that's a haul. So if you're trying to do that and balance work and family, that's a, that's a, a stretch for anybody. It was indeed. I mean, I had an apartment in Macomb, and I loved the teacher. I mean, great faculty, you know, really good school, nothing, nothing wrong with you know, the experience at all, except it's a Macomb, like you say. Right. It's like over a four-hour drive. I took the train, which was three hours one way, 
and I did all my curriculum in three days. I stayed two nights, then came back. And that went on for three years. So it was great that it worked out that way. Thank God for Amtrak. Yeah, those those are those are tricky. Those are tricky. You know, I, I taught base. They're talking about the edge on top. I taught base at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater for five years, and sadly, no no train from Evanston to Whitewater. So I did you know oh. lots of long long winter drives. But the gig I did longer and a little more you know kind of my jam was I was yeah I taught at DePaul, and I did I, like you were talking about splitting lessons earlier. I split with Dennis Carroll, um, the, the, the jazz students, their first couple years. So I would teach them, quote unquote, classical bass technique or whatever you want to say. And then Dennis would <laughs> do jazz. So I, and I think that arrangement works pretty well there or for those students. But that's kind of, that's kind of what you were doing with the, the student at, was it at Roosevelt? Or that you were right. doing? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's what I did last year. Okay. He, he actually graduated. Um, uh, yes, yes and no, because Scott Mason is also a jazz player. Mm-hmm. We both have classical technique. He just wanted to study with me, mm-hmm. and that was nice. You know, I know what you're saying, though, because the typical paradigm of the universities is to always have the, the classical, and then you also take jazz lessons if you're a jazz major. You know, it's it's slowly becoming um, probably more beneficial even to the students to have just a jazz major because so many bassists like ourselves play both and and can definitely teach the technique, if not the repertoire, and you know help with that in the in in the jazz sensibility too. So it's not always as necessary as the old model, I think, where the bassist or any instrumentalist had to get classical technique only from the classical uh, department. Right. You know? Yeah, no, it's always, it was always, I mean, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to teach there, you know, but, but I, but it, it is that it's kind of a strange model. It's, it feels almost a little condescending, right, to the other teacher. It's like, well, let me show you how to really play the bit, you know, and then, then you can go do that right. creative work with that. But that's, and then, and then in that exactly. role, it's like, what am I, uh, like, what should I, what would help this student, right? It's like, I don't, I, like, do I, are we going to work on, the Bottazzini concerto or orchestra excerpts or just technique. And so I I struggled for, for all those years of just like how to approach, like, what can I give this student that'll help them later, you know, in whatever their career ends up being. I'd love your thoughts as someone who like, you've got chops on both sides, you know, in terms of classical and jazz. And uh, what do you, what would have been a good thing for me to focus on in that role? I don't have that job anymore. I live out in San Francisco, but like <laughs> what, what, what would you recommend someone with a gig like I had focus on? That's a great question because I think that is an essential question. What do you focus on? I mean, a lot of times I ask the students what they're, in this case, I don't have to because they're jazz majors, so I get it. And I give them etudes and go through some of the classical repertoire that I had to, and then, and then break the rules with Raboff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and suggest cello suites, because I think that Bach is a very jazzy, jazzy guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and it's music. And yeah. that's the, the, the relevant question is, like, you know, some, some people will shy away from it if, they're, if you feel like they're going to, do better by playing a, a fairly simple solo piece in classical music and get some of the technique and that's going to involve them better. Maybe that's a good way to go. Uh, a lot of times with the jazz players, they don't even want to do that. <laughs> but, you know, I insist, you know, that they work on their bow, bowing. And it is a great question. Some people would want to do both and then you would, yeah, dive into the Bodicini.
Marlene actually went back to school in the middle of her professional career and studied with Chicago Symphony bassist Rob Cassinger. Rob teaches at DePaul. I used to teach with him, and he's been on the podcast in the past. And here's why Marlene went back to school and what she learned working with Rob. I went back because I felt I didn't have enough to give classically to my students at Western. So I started studying with uh, Rob Cassinger from the CSO, who is fabulous and also plays jazz, but, it, you know, he's, He's not one of the classical pieces or people that look down their nose at playing jazz. He, he, he does it. He loves it. You know, he, he owns an electric bass and plays it. He's like, <laughs> and he's this great classical player. And I just remember him being that way. And I said, this would be great because I won't feel like I'm being kind of, you know, he will condescend uh, and he'll get it. And, and I feel like I have something, you know, more to give to my students. Um, I don't like the feeling of not having something to give. <laughs> well, and, and how cool to, to like keep, I mean, like we're never, we're never done studying, right? Like I'm, I feel like I'm c- continuing to get better all the time. And like Rob Cassinger, what a great, he's like one of the most well-rounded bass players I think I've ever, ever met. And yeah, what, a, uh, I th- he was like, the house bassist in back in Denver for some jazz club when he was in high school, like growing up there, it, it sounded like he was. Oh, really? Yeah. He, it's he, wow. it sounded like he was headed that direction. And it wasn't until I think he, it was meeting Homer Mensch in, in New York. I think he went to New York to study jazz and then got, oh. just got fascinated with the classical thing, but yeah, fascinating guy and great. What did, what did you work on in, in lessons with Rob? Do you remember like, uh, any of the materials or exercises or pieces? He had a whole book of various things. Some of it was from the Storch Rob, 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 Rob. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, some maybe from Rufus's, uh, definitely from Eugene Levinson's book. Uh, just a whole bunch of between the right hand and the left hand. Boeing and left hand. Different positions, different fingerings I hadn't thought of, use of the thumb a little bit lower, (laughs) definitely a whole different thing with my right hand, more focused and better. We round out today's episode with some advice that Marlene has for players looking to get into the jazz scene. Things have changed a lot, of course, as we all know, in the decades that Marlene's been active. But what can people do to get into the scene? And before we do that, I'd like to give a shout out to our final sponsor, the Bass Violin Shop. And if you're looking for a bass rental, they've got you covered. If you're traveling in the Carolinas or attending a festival or workshop and you need a bass, get in touch with the Bass Violin Shop for a short-term rental. You can find them at BassViolinShop.com. All right, back to the final part of our conversation with Marlene Rosenberg. What do you tell the students that you work with at Northern or that you worked with at Northwestern, like just about what should they do off of the instrument to set themselves up for hopefully a career? I would say what helped me, and I do think though it it is still a current way to connect with people is by going out to hear people playing music. The group you like, go out and hear them. And connect with these people and tell them how much you love hearing them play. Become friends and you have a relationship with these people. You might get invited to sit in. They get to hear you play. They're like, yeah, I need a bass player. You know, my guy's not going to be here this one night, you know, and so on. And then the piano player hears you go, oh, I like you, you know, that kind of thing. It, It just kind of domino effects from the relationships that you make with these people in earnest because... You love the way they play. It's mutually beneficial because, you know, they're probably older, most likely. You're younger or, you know, and or even if you're the same age, you know, and you like someone the way they play and you strike up a friendship and a relationship that can go somewhere 
with the advent of Facebook, of course, there's a lot of that that you can do in cyberspace, certainly promotion and also relationship. You can begin a relationship in real, real time, <laughs> you know, by meeting somebody that you've always wanted to, but begin it online. You definitely can connect with people uh, globally that way, easily now. Uh, it's funny, Curtis Lundy was in town and we were talking and he was like, see that hotel there? See, that's the kind of, I see a piano. That's the kind of thing that says, that needs music. And I'd go in there and just strike up a conversation with him. I was like, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Old school. Yeah, just walk in the joint. You see a piano and say, you need music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sell, sell, sell. Yeah. You know, and uh, it sort of reminded me that, yeah, I need to do that again. Because there are some places that you think, you know, hey, I got a feeling about this. Uh, yeah, close to home, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I could work out a deal with someone. Marlene, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, check out her website, marlenemusic.com. She's super active as a teacher, as a performer. She's always into new projects and just such an inspiring person. So thank you for chatting, Marlene. And thanks for listening, folks. I really hope you enjoy this. You know, anybody who's in the world of jazz in any sort of capacity, I put them into a category on the on the website, ContrabassConversations.com, and you can find all those artists by typing ContrabassConversations.com slash jazz. So that will take you to my conversation with Larry Grenadier, Ron Carter, Marlene Rosenberg, uh, let's see, Gary Peacock, Carlos Henriquez, the, uh, the uh, Rufus Reed, I don't even know where, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people I've chatted with, and there are a lot of people coming up. So if you want to find those jazz artists, if you're sifting through the podcast and you want to drill down into the world of jazz specifically, that's a great way to do it. And another great way to do it is with our Contrabass Conversations app. You can search through the entire archive of 400 plus episodes. Just go into that app and type jazz and any episode that features jazz in any capacity will come up. Or if you want to look for a specific guest, Ron Carter, type that in, boom, there you go. You can listen to it, you can star it and favor it and share it out. It's a great app. I, if you don't have it, pick it up. It's free. Why not? You've got an Android phone, you've got a Kindle, you've got an iPhone. We've got versions for you for all of those. Thank you so much for listening. I do this each and every week, and I love hearing from people that follow along. Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com will get you in touch with me, and I respond to each and every message I get. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>